I don't think I have the ability. Here we go. Sorry. Got it. Hi everyone, it's right at four. Maybe we should just wait a minute just to see how people are doing logging in. Who has optional beverage? Mm -hmm. I see a couple of us. <laughs> I thought you said it was mandatory. So oh, I'm sorry, I meant mandatory. I didn't mean mandatory. <laughs> sorry, thank you, Michael. <laughs> It's four o'clock somewhere, right? In Philly, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> welcome if you're joining. We can't see you as you join, so we'll just say welcome here and just give it a moment before we get started. Oh, good. We've got 38 people joining. We had a whole bunch more sign up. So we'll just wait one more moment and I think we'll be fine and get started. Welcome, everybody. They have to put the kids in the basement, Shelly. <laughs> and I know you only know from experience. I had to do the same thing. It takes exactly. quite a while. <laughs> Don't mind that banging behind me. <laughs> I think I see people banging on the window outside there, Michael. They yeah. might want back yeah. in. <laughs> All right, we got a few more. Hello, thanks for joining everybody. We got a couple more logging in. <laughs> I'm afraid to hit any button. I'm afraid it's going to go off, so I'll just let it go. I'll let yeah. Dylan do the controls. We had a warning that uh, do we know that we can be seen and heard? We know. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if we didn't. <laughs> oh, that's funny. The panelist asks if they are on mute, which they are right until the end. Yes. Got it. <laughs> it allows us just to share frivolous things in the meantime. Yeah. Utilize the webinar chat, right? If anybody needs to flag yes. anything. Yeah. All right, it's a few minutes after. What do you think? Should we give it a go, everybody? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, HR at Home Happy Hour, the important part of that a title. Cheers. Welcome. <laughs> um, I, thanks for joining. Thanks so much for being interested in joining. Um, I'm Shelly Azen. I'm going to be one of a couple of panelists who will introduce themselves here in just a moment. Um, and then we'll talk about the agenda. Generally speaking, everyone is on mute and we don't think we can see you. <laughs> we know you can see and hear us, but we cannot see you. There's a Q&A feature um, on the menu, either at the top or bottom of your screen, if you want to submit questions as we go along. There were two questions also submitted in advance, which we'll get to. Um, and what I'd like to do now is just have our panel introduce themselves. And so I'll turn it over first to Keith Black. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I need to clear up the expectation that uh, Shelly is not providing the alcohol that is optional <laughs> for this event. Uh, that's, I know right. that's why a lot of people attend. <laughs> um, welcome, glad you could join us. Um, my name is Keith Black. I'm with uh, Employment Practices Outsourcing, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, with Shelly and Michael and Vicky today to to help give you a little bit of information. Hopefully, provide some um, some tips and and tricks, and also just to have some camaraderie with our fellow HR leaders in a difficult time. So glad to spend the next uh, four and a half hours with you. <laughs> <laughs> Give or take. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Hardin, co-founder of Juno Search Partners uh, search and staffing firm mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. And I'm Vicki Sack, uh, Michael's business partner, also co-founder of Juno Search Partners. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, so just to talk a little bit about our objectives, we were talking, I don't know, maybe starting two weeks ago, and some of the things we talked about was, we just really miss our friends in the HR community, right? Normally we would be at Disrupt HR or a PSPS event or something along those lines, and we just really sort of miss the camaraderie of our community. 
um, not only for educational purposes, which is often why we get together, but also just for fun and sharing best practices. And so we thought maybe this could be a way we could replicate that for ourselves and for you because we miss you. <laughs> um, and what we would love to do is turn this into hopefully a weekly event where we can share some legal updates um, as well as you share with us what you're doing to help make your business sustain and successful as we think about the future, whatever that is. So we're just going to share a couple of things that we've learned over the last few weeks at the end, open it up for a Q and A. And then we would love to solicit you telling us what you want to hear going forward and having you tell your stories, not always hearing the four of us to share our stories. So that's the objective, have some fun, connect, kick back, maybe learn a few things. Uh, and then we'll chat together at the end. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Keith to get us started on some legal updates. Great. And, um, you know, when we talked about doing this and setting this up, the intent was not for this to be yet another uh, legal uh, explanation of all of the new laws out there, because everybody's probably been to, to more than those than they care to go to. But what we thought was helpful was because things are changing so quickly that each week when we do this, we'll just give a quick update as to anything new that week that may have developed. So for this first week, we're just going to kind of set the table with where we are in terms of the, the major laws that we're dealing with, understanding that they're changing regularly and that they're probably going to be added to shortly as well. Um, but just as kind of uh, setting the bar, we're talking about the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act or the FFCRA and the CARES Act. And um, we're just going to really quickly summarize you know, the, the FFCRA has two major components to it, which is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act or the EPSLA, which provides up to two weeks of pay at uh, cap to $200 a day and uh, the Emergency FMLA. I think everybody probably is pretty much as aware of these as they need to be right now. So we're not gonna go into a lot of detail about them, but just to point out that those are really the two components, the two major aspects of those laws and then following that was the CARES Act, which then brought in the, the pay, Paycheck Protection Program, which is really the main part of that. And I'm understanding now from talking to some clients that those, those loans are coming in. I know a couple who received them just this week. Um, so that's starting to happen. The Paycheck Protection Program, like the FFCRA, is for employers under 500 employees. There's also the direct lending aspect of the CARES Act for employers with 500 to 10,000 employees. So they're a little different in terms of scope and what they cover, but those are really the laws that we're focusing on right now and, and keeping up to date with all of the FAQs and guidance that the Department of Labor and the IRS and other agencies are putting out. Okay, should we move that, Shelley? And the other thing um, <clears throat> that's a real big issue right now is the impact on unemployment compensation. And as we know, unemployment compensation is really regulated by the states on a state by state level. But there is federal guidance that goes into that and the Department of Labor has some say in it. They changed some of the eligibility requirements that the states could choose to adopt. So it opens it up to a much wider group of individuals who may be self-employed, um, may be independent contractors, maybe not even formally separating from their jobs and can now be entitled to unemployment. And the real key is that it added this $600 per week supplement to whatever an individual would be entitled to under their state unemployment laws. And it extended the time frame for an additional 13 weeks. So in some cases, um, we could have situations theoretically where individuals can make more money on a weekly basis if they're unemployed than they were when they were working. So. There's already been one attempt in Congress to try to address that and try to fix that. Um, I expect that that will be something that's addressed further uh, as that doesn't seem to sit well with people. And what most people seem to think is fair is cap it at what the individual would have made when they were working, but don't provide an incentive to not work. And then the other thing is the difference between furlough and layoffs, which we get a lot of questions about. Prior to this in the private sector, meaning non-government, uh, we didn't really have much use of furloughs. It was much more of a, a public sector tool. Now, as we're looking at ways to keep the business going, keep people employed, furloughs are coming into play. And that's just a reduction in hours or a reduction in days where uh, someone is kept on the payroll. And that's the big difference between a furlough and a layoff. In a furlough situation, you're still actively employed. You're just not being paid for a certain time period. And under these changes to the unemployment compensation, 
you will in all likelihood be entitled to unemployment benefits during times when you're furloughed. So that's, um, that's just a quick update on that. And as we move into this, as I said earlier, on a weekly basis, we're gonna look at changes that occur since our last meeting and we'll update you on those. One of the things I also wanted to mention, and this was highlighted uh, just yesterday um, when there was an issue with a, a NASCAR driver, that just because we're working from home and we're not necessarily in the workplace doesn't mean that misconduct goes on vacation. So please be aware uh, of things that can happen in the workplace that can still be violations of your policies or inappropriate conduct. In the NASCAR situation, a driver was doing a virtual race because the NASCAR circuit suspended and was caught on a hot mic making uh, racially inappropriate comments that everyone who was tuned in heard. So um, the immediate impact on him, he lost his main sponsors and he was um, suspended indefinitely without pay. So it's a good yeah, example yeah. to show that just because we're not in our regular workplace situation, you've gotta be aware there's still harassment, there's still inappropriate conduct that could take place in meetings like this. We need to be aware of our backgrounds, um, what's behind us, what might be on the clothing we wear in virtual meetings, what we say when we don't think we're necessarily on microphone, what members of our family may say or hear around us. Um, there's just a blurring of those lines between privacy and workplace. And it's a very unusual situation and we just need to understand of, be aware of it, and understand that we still need to follow up on these issues when they happen and encourage employees that if something does happen, still need to bring it to our attention. We need to investigate even if that's virtually. So Keith, I'm sorry to interrupt for you, but there's a question for you. I don't know if anyone sees it, Michael or Dylan, if you see it, if you could read it off to Keith. Yep, um, so Nora has a question about UC benefit expansion um, supplement and extension. I don't, can we unmute her or Nora, can you ex expound upon that? All right. She, she says, sure. She's typing. <laughs> we'll get better at this. <laughs> <laughs> or just pour a couple more and we'll seem great at it. <laughs> She's typing in a response. Yeah. Right. Lay it off before this hit. Yep. And I also hear that my mute, my microphone has been unmuted. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Nora. How are you? Hi, guys. Thank you for inviting me. This is really wonderful. Of course. Um, so thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I know this can't be about, you know, personal situations and all that jazz, but I'm so confused because I was laid off. My last day was January 31st. So I'm like right before COVID, but I, I don't know. Do I qualify as one of the COVID layer offies? I don't know. But um how does that work? I, I can't seem to get an answer. Will, will my unemployment be supplemented? Will it be extended? I don't know. And I can't seem to get an answer. Do you have to qualify as a certain type of layoff situation? Like, does it have to be COVID-19 related? And how do they prove that? Well, first, first of all, I'm sorry for your, for your layoff. Um, and I think the, the answer you're getting that nobody really knows is unfortunately the reality of, of when laws like this are pushed through so quickly uh, without really a lot of time to think about what that means. So what, what does happen to individuals like you who might have been laid off right before we really became aware of this or right before these laws with the enhancement kicked in and what state are you in and are states treating them differently? So I think the best, the best advice um, would be to just you know, apply for it, see how your state handles it. As we get better guidance on what this means, which I'm, so, I'm sure will be coming, we'll have clearer answers. But yeah. to your point, nobody really is real clear on some of these questions. And that's one that I actually was just talking about with someone earlier today. You know, what happens if you did happen to be laid off and, and seek unemployment right before all of this started to happen. And, and I'm not really sure, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, and it's, it's really one of the concerns I have is, you know, my, uh, my job search was going, was pretty hot and then bang, you know, so even though we're not technically affected by COVID and that we weren't laid off because of it, the job search has gone completely kaput, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That helped me. I'm just going to hound the people at my unemployment office now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you, Tony, to that suggestion there. If you do go on, and I'm not sure if you're in Pennsylvania or what state, but each state usually has 
if you go to their unemployment website, they usually have FAQs yeah. on COVID-19 and, and whether it addresses these situations and uh, they, they might get answers for you that way. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think we finished with this slide. So one of the things that we wanted to do today also was to really just give a sense of what have we been seeing? What are some of the issues that have been raised during the last few weeks? What are some best practices? And, you know, a lot of things that you can be doing, should be doing, that's up to you if it's can or should, but we are now permitted to screen employees as they enter the workplace, you know, take their temperatures, which in the past would have been something that we would have never thought of doing. Um, but one important thing there is to understand that if you do implement something like this and you require employees to be screened prior to entering work and that takes additional time before their shift starts, they need to be compensated for that time if they're a non-exempt employee. So if they need to get there 15 or 20 minutes earlier to start their shift at nine, you're gonna to have to pay them for that time if you're requiring it. Uh, you are permitted to send employees home if they seem like they have some symptoms. Um, you should have a, a policy addressing FFCRA and, and leave forms that are out there. I know Sherm put out a model policy, the Department of Labor was putting out leave forms. Just be prepared, be aware of these things and always try to make sure that you're doing everything you can to make sure that your employees feel safe in, and supported in these times. Recognizing it's going to end, but right now it is what we have to deal with. And if you do your very best to support them during these times, that's the best thing you can do as an employer. I'm not going to talk so much about the recruiting and hiring part. I'll leave that to, to our experts, uh, Vicki and Michael, on that piece. But these are just some things that have come up that we, we look at and we want to make sure that we're not forgetting about and that we're taking into consideration during, during this very unusual situation we're in. Um, and I'll just ask if there are any chats. I can't see those. So someone, Michael or Vicki or Keith, interrupt me if there's a chat that I need to, to stop for, please. Um, and so what I wanted to talk a little bit about is how as, you know, HR practitioners, generalists, VPs, directors, whatever your title is, how do we help our business move forward? Um, I was on a call, um, a, a global HR call with um, Josh Burson, which if you belong to PSPS, you may have been able to have the benefit of see, seeing him speak uh, two out of the last three years, I think. And, and, and one of the women on the call said something to the effect of, you know, if you look back into 2008, when the housing market crashed, certainly there were businesses that were directly impacted, housing market, uh, housing lenders, banks, et cetera. Some of us were also impacted because the economy took a downturn. But when you look back, you, your business likely survived if you were on the outskirts of that housing market um, because, or housing business because you probably had a really smart financial person that helped you navigate those rough waters. And we're thinking that five or 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, gosh, the companies that survived now or did a good job of surviving is probably because they had a good HR person. Um, and so I feel like this is our moment. This is our ability to uh, shine and help lead the business, not only in what people are calling being the chief empathy officer, but how we help business leaders just think about doing things differently. Um, I have friends that work at a company that uh, is headquartered in Denver. And one of the things they've shared with me, they have, it's an outpatient healthcare company and they have clinics, uh, I think in every state across the country, uh, multiple clinics. And in New York, as you might imagine, where the virus has hit people the, the hardest thus far, they have 200 nurses. So it's almost 50% of their nurse workforce at home with the virus who cannot come to work. And so if you think about that, if HR is headquartered in Denver and there's a crisis, a real crisis in New York, not only just for human beings, but with their workforce and their business, how, we, how they solve for what's happening in New York and how to fix it is very different than probably what's happening in Oklahoma or Seattle, Washington or Kansas City, Missouri. And so I think one of the things we have to think about is that if we have a centralized HR function, we have to be practical at what I'll call the local level. That example is a good one. So what, a, what the folks in New York need to do to be successful is very different than what be, might be happening in the rest of the country. And so how do we enable our business to make those decisions at the local level, I think is, is critical. And then similarly, how are we quick and nimble in, in helping people cut, cut to the chase and get to the answer without going through a lot of bureaucracy around 
policies and our policy says we can't do that. And, you know, this page of the handbook says no, like just how do we cut through all that and help our business be successful to survive? Um, I think another important component is how do you think about putting what I'll call really important decisions or side projects on hold, maybe temporarily. I have a, I have a good example of a client who back in January, I think it was, started to go down the path of replacing their record keeper for 401k. You know, the assumption is that they're paying too much money in fees and they could probably do it better if they bundle and get a more national firm, not a boutique firm to help them. Um, had a call with the benefits director and um, their, their record keeper last week. We were looking at the scorecard for the RFP and I just took a second and said, is this the right time to tell your employees you're completely changing their options for 401k investments and completely maybe changing record keepers and going from, I'll make this up, Fidelity to Vanguard or Transamerica or T. Rowe Price? Probably not, <laughs> right? In a time when people are super sensitive about their money anyway, the stock market is going up and down. It probably isn't the smartest time to make that decision for the business. And so those are the kinds of conversations I think we have to think about that say what really is necessary right now or what would cause stress to the business and is it unnecessary stress for the moment? And so I think we have to just reprioritize what we're working on. And then similarly, um, I, I like the term of think beyond the triage. So as an HR practitioner and, and, and helping some of my clients and talking to some of you, what I heard is the first, you know, two, three weeks, it was a lot of triage, like get people home, get them their laptops, get them their extra screens from their desk, get them the ergonomic chair. Now that we're going to be home for, I don't know how long, um, how do we reprioritize work? How do, how do we help people who worked in the mailroom where the mailroom's not now not open? How do you give them other jobs to do now that they're working from home to support the business? And that is all really important, but we have to think about the future also. So we have to get out of sort of our triage mindset and, and think about the future. Um, and there's one example with the client that I'm working on right now that I find particularly interesting. We're certainly at the beginning phase. So maybe over the next couple of weeks, I can give you updates as to where we are. But if I could just take a minute and give you this story, I think it's gonna be fascinating. Um, my client has just under a thousand people. There are something like 350 or so employees that work in a call center in, in Philadelphia. Um, there were already about 75 or so people that have always worked from home from a, an emergency response perspective, but give or take 350 people work in the call center. On any one given day, there was a 30% absentee rate. So that includes scheduled time off and call offs. So the vice president of the call center has been uh, with the company about a year. Um, I started working with them last summer. She said, I really got to fix this absentee problem. Problem, Like we just have about 30% absentee rate. And we're working through a couple of things. We've tweaked some leave of absence policies. We've put in an attendance policy. Um, three weeks into being home, I called her and said, hey, I just sort of miss seeing you. How you doing? What's going on? And she said, you'll never guess what my absentee rate, rate is. Um, her absentee rate is zero. So day 12, um, working day 12 of being home. So two full weeks and two days, her absentee rate is zero. And I couldn't help but just laugh, right? And then she and I said, okay, what does this mean? So for me, it's one of a couple of things. Number one, people being able to be at home might, maybe, I don't know, have solved the problem for why they kept calling off. I don't know for sure, but something's working. Number two, people might just be afraid of losing their job and they're not calling off and they're being sort of, you know, good employees, if you will. Um, number three, we should check the productivity metrics to see if everybody is really working at home or if those folks who would have typically, typically called off for, I don't know, other reasons are really working and on the phone and serving their members and their quality statistics are where they need to be. Um, or maybe it's a combination of all of those. And so what I said to her is, you know, I think maybe you and I need to figure out how to get some more metrics around this. Maybe what we'll find is we know what an ideal um, call center agent looks like for you, for this business. Maybe people just need part-time hours and full-time hours. And then what does that mean? Um, they, again, making this up, they, they don't have children at home. Maybe they have a spouse that works outside the home. I don't know. But if we could profile what a great work from home call center agent looks like that would reduce your absentee rate, I think we just figured out a new way of recruiting. And that means outside of Philadelphia, where they're coming to the office on Market Street, it means we could hire them in Kansas City or Texas or Los Angeles or Boston. I don't know. But imagine what that would do for your service levels, as well as uh, the, the cost of not having 350 people sit in a building in Center City, Philadelphia, which we all know is quite expensive. 
so I think those are the kinds of things when I say think beyond the triage that I think we have the opportunity to engage in dialogue with the business that perhaps we've not done before and really where they're looking for us to give them almost the blessing to do things differently. So stay tuned on my friends in the call center. I hope to have some really interesting um, commentary about this in the future. Um, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Michael, who has a really interesting and I think heartfelt story to, to share with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we really wanted to build upon to, to Shelley's earlier point, um, thinking beyond the triage and talk about what we as a, as a small firm in Philadelphia are thinking about in terms of next steps, bringing, bringing our folks back to the office. Um, and, I'll, and I'll start with a, a story that leaves us a little exposed and vulnerable, but, but it's true and I'm sure we all have one, you know, by, by this time. So we left the office on March 12th, um, thinking probably like a lot of folks were thinking that maybe this would just be a week or two. Um, the city had not shut down at that point. There were rumblings of it, starting to be school, school closures, so on and so forth. We left, um, we left that Thursday and obviously still haven't, haven't been back. So we are, uh, for, for anybody who doesn't know us, we're a search and staffing firm. And we essentially think of ourselves as having you know, sort of three streams of revenue. So we place contractors, and then we place obviously direct hire permanent. Uh, and then we have a division that does project staffing, which is more sort of like customizable talent solutions. And so left on Thursday, Friday, you know, feeling nervous, but not panicked. And, you know, our team was, you know, feeling optimistic, saying that they were still having good conversations, so on and so forth. And I would say Monday, the city uh, announced the shutdown. And then by Tuesday, it, it just felt like everywhere we looked, something was on fire and something was crumbling. And so we had, you know, the first thing that was, that was hit really hard was the contractors. We just, you know, we're, we're currently probably down 60% uh, in terms of the contractor revenue. And that happened seemingly really quickly, just, you know, casino closures and, you know, retail closures. Um, and so the second thing that that started to happen, obviously, was um, uh, you know searches getting canceled, searches getting postponed. We even had one or two rescinded offers, so the deal was done. We, you know the company had to rescind, and then we started getting um, messages that projects were canceling or put on hold, or you know can we skip this month and see what happens, so on and so forth. So it was you know you call it the worst seventy two hours. It 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 felt more like three hours, but it was probably over longer than that. And it was just, it was, it was catastrophic in a, in a short amount of time. And so, you know, Vicki and I were crying on the phone to each other all day. I noticed she's drinking a big glass of wine right now. I think she hasn't stopped drinking wine since that day. I'm, that, that's another thing I'm worried about, but we'll talk about that later. Just kidding. Um, and so we, we started to, you know, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive, right? Um, so we decided to lay off half the team. And it was, you know, I, I could cry just talking about it. It was the, you know, the toughest day, the, the day that was meant to be our, our St. Patty's Day celebration. We kind of, you know, I, I, I hid in, in the back room so my kids wouldn't see me and just, you know, had, had to lay off half of our team. And so the next day we were, you know, tasked with rallying the other half of the team. So we had this, you know, which was almost impossible to do because we are, you know, anybody who knows our, our firm, we are a little family and, you know, and it, and it hit everybody really hard. And then, you know, there was an interesting, you know, what sort of comes out of that because one half of the team that was, you know, saved for lack of a better term feels guilty and, you know, and we're worried about the other half, but we're, you know, sort of like we gotta we gotta forge through. We'll we'll get this back on track. We'll come back for them. You know, obviously it wasn't. You know, we didn't lay off anybody for a performance issue. It was you know purely tethered to this event. Um, and then I would say, you know, I always say for me in my life, it's better it's better to be lucky than good. Um, you know, three days later, in a very ser serendipitous way, we um, had an opportunity to get a really large contract. And so we have been working on it ever since. We are, um, we are staffing uh, COVID-19 field hospitals, hotspots all around the country and actually now internationally. And so I won't go into how that all happened. It was very serendipitous. And um, 
that Friday, so we laid everybody off on Tuesday. And that Friday, I was on conference calls all night. And that morning, I was on conference calls again. And then by noon that day, I think we had, you know, maybe the contract in place. And we hired everybody back um, to execute this contract. And so it was, you know, what a roller coaster of emotion because, you know, not only did we get to hire everybody back, but also we were doing, you know, we were fully in the trenches of this really unique, meaningful project. And, you know, of course we had never staffed field hospitals um, before, but we're, you know, a very nimble, talented team and everybody dug right in and, and, you know, really we, we have been working seven days a week um, happily, happily doing this. And so sort of now here we are a couple weeks later and the dust has settled on a few things and we're finding this, um, you know, interesting shift in our culture that, you know, on one hand we had this, you know, search team that, that made it through that layoff. And then three days later, you know, they were not part of the team that was tasked with kind of, you know, saving the country and saving the world. And sort of that came with its own set of emotions. And, you know, of course, you know, the, the search, the, the, you know, the, the great employees that we have doing the, the search business, you know, they're, they have a tough job right now, you know, because they're, you know, they, they never know what's going to happen from one day to the next, you know, searches that are going just fine, you know, might, we might have the pause button or they decided to wait or they're canceling it. So, um, you know, it's been an interesting time to be a, a search and staffing firm, obviously, but I think you could say that across a lot of different industries right now. Um, and so now we're starting to think about, um, you know, our team, like a lot of teams has, has been, been through hell and back and has, um, gone through this whole roller coaster of emotions and still is not to mention that, you know, we're all going through a very traumatic life experience and we're still doing that while trying to, you know, homeschool our kids and be good spouses and partners and worried about the health and safety of, you know, our employees and our family. And, you know, um, we're hearing a lot of tragic stories and, you know, uh, thinking about how that's affecting us mentally and how that's affecting our team mentally and recognizing that, you know, not everybody's stress response is the same. And we have certainly seen that, uh, you know, in going through this, I'm, I'm seeing this, you know, in my own family I think I'm going to have to go, you know, sort of uh, break my mom out of the jail she's put her in. I, I'm, I'm scared for what I'm going to find when this is all over. But, um, you know, but we're trying to be sensitive to that, you know, for, for our employees. And I think that, you know, again, Shelly, just to kind of build on your, you know, on your uh, earlier point, everybody's watching right now. And this is a very meaningful time to make a very, you know, meaningful impact in the lives of our employees because this has, you know, this has impact, impacted us all in, in so many, in so many ways. And so I'll let Vicki take over in terms of what we're thinking of on sort of how to not only bring everybody back physically, you know, but also kind of rebuild a culture that is, you know, of course, a little bit, um, in some cases, in some areas, maybe a little bit fractured and in some areas, maybe stronger than ever, but how to be one cohesive team again when, you know, when, when we've been through what we've been through in the past four weeks. So I'll, I'll kick it over. So, yeah, so what, I, what we've been talking about, I mean, over the course of the past week, to, to Shelly's point, we've gone from this triage mode into a little bit more strategy. And I think, you know, with, with all of the the state governors and, and the president talking about returning to work, Obviously, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And, and, and we're pretty sure it's going to happen in stages. And so how do you start preparing for that next step where everyone comes back? And we sort of are, have been thinking about it in, in two different areas. And one is just the pure logistics of bringing, it back, bringing everyone back. And then the other piece is more of um, bringing teams together culturally and how will your culture shift and how can you um, accommodate lots of different needs that are going to come up. So, you know, the, we just want to share some things. We certainly don't have a crystal ball, nor do we have all the answers, but thought we would just raise some things that we're talking about to get everybody else sort of thinking about those things and getting your heads, you know, thinking in that direction about what you might be doing in your organizations. And then maybe as this, this series goes on, we can start to share some, 
some really thoughtful, great ideas on, on what you're doing at your organization. I mean, every organization is different from a size perspective, from, you know, a space perspective. Um, and so, and some roles are different than others. So, so who you can bring back when, um, but, but some, some really basic logistical things, we want people to feel safe coming back. So we've been talking about things like, um, doing a deep clean of the office and making sure that when people do come back that we have the proper hygiene in place that we're wiping things down that people are washing their hands we've thought about bringing people back in stages so that not everybody is coming back at the same time and we can still practice social distancing and make sure that people aren't sitting close together and people aren't huddling up in conference rooms or having lunch at little tables together and that there's you know people are separated sufficiently while they're at the office um, and you know potentially are we still wearing masks and gloves and all of those things that we have to be thinking about so that that's one piece of it um, the other piece is is a child care situation that a lot of companies are going to be facing obviously schools are out in pennsylvania and new jersey and 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 people are going to potentially be coming back to work with zero child care at home we have no idea what the summer is going to hold with day camps, and I don't know when daycares are going to start opening up. Um, but I think we have to start thinking about flexible work arrangements for parents um, who may not have, you know, some, some may be single parents and are really struggling, and then others may have to switch schedules with their spouses. Um, and so thinking about how we can work around and be understanding to, to individual situations, this is going to be a moment in time where everybody's situation is going to be different and we can't be so rigid in following the company handbook to the letter um, and really work out individual arrangements with each of our employees to make them feel safe, to make them feel um, like they're being heard and that they, they can come back in a successful way. The other piece is mass transit. We have a lot of employees that, that come to our office and don't have cars and they take public transportation. And so, are there going to be restrictions on SEPTA? Are there going to be um, limited train schedules? Um, are people going to be comfortable getting on a train? Um, and at what point? So not that, again, not that we have a crystal ball, but I think these are things that we need to start thinking about now um, so, that, so that we can, we can phase this back in. And, and it could be, that this could go on for months. I mean, we don't know um, how long we're gonna have to do these things. And then from a, uh, Michael touched on this, um, from a mental health perspective, I think it is hugely important that we are supportive from a mental health standpoint. And, and I think different organizations are going to have different capabilities in this, but we've been thinking about, you know, having open dialogues on how people are handling this emotionally. I mean, there are some people that are going to be depressed. There are some people that are going to have high levels of anxiety. And these things are going to exhibit themselves in very different ways. Um, and, and I think that, and, and they're going to have spouses and children and family members that are going to be dealing with those things too. And, and I heard something today that there are people that are, it's almost equivalent to some form of PTSD for some people coming out of this. And so understanding that, you know what, there are going to be days when someone's just not feeling like coming to work for whatever reason and, and being respectful of that and how they're handling that um, and maybe providing different avenues for people to, uh, you know, a lot of companies have, um, you know, psychologists or support groups and things like that, that they can put together. And I think those are things that people should be thinking about ongoing. Um, and then I'm going to go back to go over to the culture piece of things. So the unique the one thing that we're dealing with, and I think a lot of people are dealing with, is this idea. I mean, tons of companies have done temporary layoffs and furloughs. So how, you know, to Michael's point, we have a very, we have a very tight knit group at Juno. And how do we get that back when some of our team, you know, was temporarily let go and some people stayed? And how do we bring them all back together in a good place? and get them all re-engaged and understand that we're all still working towards a common goal. On the positive side, the one thing that this has allowed us to do is really look at, I think it's really come to light, some of the pieces of, of everyone's roles that they really love and are really good at. And this project that Michael was referencing earlier has given people to, the opportunity to flex some different muscles that they didn't know they had. Um, and some of them are really loving it. 
And so, you know, it's, it's kind of time to reflect on, do we have the people, the right people in the right seats? And maybe it's time to rethink how our company works and how we do work and who's doing what work. And we have an opportunity to look at our company and see what's, what was going right before, what was going wrong. We have a really unique opportunity to fix a lot of things and tweak a lot of things and make them better. And then ultimately come out in a better place to, to reallocate resources, to work differently, to give you know, people a chance to maybe work from home a little more than they, they had traditionally and, and give them a little bit better work-life balance, a little less stress, um, and be a little more flexible. Well, I was kicked out for a short I noticed. Of time. I uh, <laughs> Vicky solved the, all your problems. They're all the, taken care of. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to assume she, you know, she was brilliant. I've relocated, as you can see, because the uh, your Wi-Fi went away. I guess so. So, so I, I will leave it that, that these are very open-ended um, topics and I think very suited for a more interactive dialogue down the road. But we, we, we throw those out there because I think they're topics that we should be talking about in this weekly session ongoing and maybe delve deeper into them as we get closer to the other side of the path back, going back to work and what that looks like. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you for... First, I think sharing such a personal story. Again, I don't know who's on the line here today, but my guess is we're all sort of two or three degrees of separation from, from Juno at some point. Uh, so thank you for sharing such a personal story and thanks for doing such amazing work for you know, this crazy world we're living in right now. Um, and it's interesting as, we, as I think about just some of the examples that we've all shared, it's around return to work logistics. So are we gonna take people's temperatures? Are we gonna have a policy for um, uh, uh, first of all, policy for this, and then how are we going to sit and interact uh, and have meetings? And we need flexible work arrangements, whether people work three days a week from home and two days a week from the office, so we can sort of share space and not be all packed in cubicles like we used to. What about SEPTA? I mean, I take SEPTA into the city a lot too for my clients, and I'm thinking I probably won't do that for a while. I don't know, right? But it sounds like we're just, and, and then the mental health sort of EAP aspect. Um, I think are all things that we share common questions around all of those categories. Um, and so now, I, you know, I'd love to open it up for some Q&A or sharing maybe a, around some of these things that you all have seen be successful at your company. Um, I think I'm going to need Dylan's help here to, let's see, there's a Q&A feature on the menu. If you want to type your question in there, we could respond and maybe figure out a way to maybe unmute you. Is there um, a way to see everybody? I don't know that. Is there ever a way to bring everybody in? Uh, I don't believe so. Yeah. All right. Continuous improvement for next week. Um, and I can't see the chat feature. I'm afraid if I hit the chat feature, I'm going to uh, get rid of the display. I, I don't know. I, I, I have it open. Um, right. it's, it's more comments than it is questions that I can see. Um, the one thing I said that is in here is uh, performance management post-crisis. Will managers have the fortitude to really performance manage in this next review cycle? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought, interesting question. I had, a, I had a call with someone today who said, as, a, as she's an HR business partner, she said maybe in July, which is our mid-year, we need to sit down with our managers and say, pull up all the review, all the goals you set. Do we need to throw those out the window and start over? Cause, cause we're not gonna meet them and maybe they don't matter right now. I, 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 it's a good question. I think these are just these ever evolving questions we have to answer. And I think there's a real fine balance there too, Shelley, um, you know, to Bill's question about that in the chat. Yeah, we want to still have a performance culture and an accountability culture, but we also need that flexibility that you talked about earlier that things have changed and to just, you know, rigorously apply something that we might have set in motion nine months ago isn't necessarily going to work. So yes, we need performance management. Yes, we need to pe hold people accountable. But we also need to be aware that things have changed and, and recognize that as we do that. There's like a really a, a fine balance between, you know, what are the initiatives that we just need to throw away now? Because like this 401k example I gave earlier, like that probably doesn't really matter right now. Actually, it doesn't matter. 
people are going to be nervous wreck about their money in a in the 401k anyway let alone changing you know record keepers now it doesn't seem like a smart decision yeah there might be other things we should start to focus on to help our businesses survive for the next several months and maybe that's where we have to just shift and be flexible i don't think there's a right answer for any of this or it, it, it's ever evolving um, well, I did have a question pop up here. How do I how do I overcome my furlough and look for another position? So I'll I'll take a step first. Certainly, you you guys can jump in. I, I don't know if that means um, I'm struggling personally that I've lost my job and I just need a little and I need some cheerleaders in my corner to help me move forward. I don't know the intent of that question. I will say if you want to shoot me your resume. I'm happy to look at it. Certainly there are more experts on the phone than me, like Michael and Vicki, but if you want another person's opinion, I'm happy to share my network with you on LinkedIn, maybe give some suggestions depending on your expertise where you might be able to make some connections. I don't know if you guys want to join in, have anything else to offer? Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, certainly from uh, anybody who is worried about, you know, an explanation or a gap in the resume, mm -hmm. you know, there's not a, a person who is not going to be understanding of sort of why that occurred. Um, you know, obviously, I think that um, there are still many companies that are hiring and there are still a lot of companies that are kind of holding their breath and push the pause button. Um, you know, so, so I think that stay the course, right? Stay the course in terms of networking and, and reaching, reaching out for, to Shelly's point, for, for advice and introductions and so forth. But um, <clears throat> I don't, I think in a couple weeks, it's going to be clear, you know, how, how the rebound is going to occur. Um, I think right now we're, some businesses are, are, just, are just on a pause. Yeah. Another great question that um, I know Michael and Vicki and Shelly, we were all talking about earlier, but how do you, address employees who were furloughed for being non-essential when they come back and not make them feel kind of a, a second class citizen that they weren't considered important enough to avoid being furloughed. Really good point. We did have yeah. two questions submit in advance. Sorry, I just wanted to maybe do those really quick. One was, um, I'm interested in learning about ideas from others on how they've been helping to keep their teams engaged during this time. Yeah, we probably didn't cover that. Uh, I can tell you for us, um, you know, we have done a couple happy hours. <laughs> There's a theme here. Shocker. We also have, we have morning huddles every day. So, and yeah. it's not because we want to micromanage, but I think that you just need to stay close to everything that's going on and stay on top of the business and stay on top of your people to make sure they're okay, address any concerns before they become a problem, make people still feel connected. Um, I've just read so much that says now is the time for leaders to over communicate constantly. And so you can't let days go by without talking to your teams. I, I have one client where the CEO sends an email every week, even if she doesn't have what she would call substantial business update, she still sends an email and I'll send her information. And so will the communications person about, you know, take a half an hour out of your day and meditate or do yoga or go stand in the sunshine outside or just something to promote your individual wellness people need to hear from the senior leader that, that, that they're still engaged and that they're as frustrated. I mean, she shares all the time. She'll say things like my husband is making me crazy and these dogs never stop barking. I can't wait to get back to the office, but we can't go yet. I feel just like you. I'm just as annoyed as you are. Um, so I think just sort of the human aspect of that. And then I think as team leaders, you know, we don't have the opportunity to have water cooler conversations or while we're both getting a cup of coffee in the little kitchenette at the office, we can't just chit chat about our weekends or our kids or, the project we're working on. And so I think as leaders, you have to create those opportunities. Um, I have one group that I know that sets up a 15 minute, we're just going to check in with each other at from one to one fifteen. If you can chime in, great. If you can, it's okay if you're stuck on a call or something, but it's a way for us just to say, hey, really quick, I keep getting these questions. How, what are you hearing? Or just to say, how are you? Like it's Wednesday. It's been already a long week. How you doing? Just, just to Again, that sort of water cold or walk by your office, have a conversation. So you, you have to create those opportunities. And I think Vicki brings up a good point. If you have a daily huddle, just to, even if it's just a check-in, like how's everyone doing today? Maybe there's not a business update, but there's just an, you know, maybe an emotional check-in. Yeah. You, you also bring up a good point too, that I think as, as leaders of organizations, 
sharing with our team um, that, you know, it, it's very easy to feel like you just constantly are attached to your laptop and you're constantly working when you're working from home mm -hmm. and taking some time to do something for yourself. Yeah. And, and Michael and I are very transparent about that with our team that, you know, Michael takes her kids on bike rides almost every day and I go for a run or I bake something with my daughter. You know, I, we, we, you have to mentally pull yourself away from it or you'll, you'll just go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think understanding, you know, in the beginning, I think that um, we were also panicked and worried and we didn't know how long this was going to last. Um, you know, I, I think that we, um, you know, that was felt of course. And I think once we kind of settled into this was going to be reality for a little while, we definitely had to communicate to our team that, we understand that um, their kids are at home and you cannot ignore your kids from eight to five. You know, that's, that's not a reasonable expectation, uh, nor would we want that quite frankly. So we understand that work is you know, being done um, in the crevices, right, right now, and maybe after bedtime and maybe parents are taking shifts. And so, you know, um, I think that we didn't communicate that to them immediately and we had to sort of explicitly say that at some point like we understand we get it we we know that you have to spend time with your kids you're at home with your kids um so you know just just communicating that understanding right um and and i think you know again i think it's a time that i know you're, you're you know as a leader you're you're not always supposed to show fear or worry or um you know you're supposed to to shield your employees from that. But I think this is a really hard thing to shield any, anyone from. And for us, for Vicki and I, you know, we have chosen the path of transparency. Um, and just like, yeah, we're, there's, there's, the, nobody has a crystal ball right now. So there's a lot of unknowns. And like the one thing we know is that we're gonna get through it and we're gonna get through it together. Um, so. There was one other question sent in in advance and it says, um, what business measures have you seen, if any, organizations put into place to protect not only, not only their employees' health, but their jobs? Um, so, wait. Say that one more time, Shelley. Yep. What business measures have we seen organizations put into place to protect not only employees' health, but their jobs? I think because most people are working remotely, the health piece is is just that, that we're all working remotely now and, and we're sort of talking about the return to work. And that's where we're talking about the first thing we talked about were the logistics around the health, mm -hmm. you know, the physical health of everyone. And then obviously we talked about the mental health as well. Um, I think every business is different about protecting jobs. I mean, I think that you do have to be uh, nimble Shelly, you have a good example of this with your one client where you took people who are working in the mail room and you re you reallocated them to another type of work temporarily so they could still have a job. Yeah. Yeah. You have a client who had, I don't know, 12 or 15 people in a mail room. They get a lot of mail, believe it or not. It's true. And, and the rest of the business was ready to go home. They have this emergency business procedure that's been in place for years. So at the flip of a switch and on the 13th of March, shut the doors and everybody went home. But these 12 or 15 people were still coming into the office doing mail. And we said, what, what are they doing? We've got to think about something different. And so the business itself does generate a lot of mail incoming and outgoing. So we come up with a plan to how to take care of that. Um, but there were a few people who weren't going to have anything to do if they weren't in the building, literally opening mail, scanning it and sending it somewhere. And so we solicited the rest of the business and said, who could use some additional administrative help? Maybe there's a backlog of filing you want to get scanned and put on the share drive. I don't know. We came up with the list and we sent them home with scanners. And someone from that function said, I'm sending you this information. We've delivered it to their home. When you get it, call me and I'll walk you through what it is, where to scan it once you scan it. I mean, just we, the client didn't want to lay people off. They, they have worked for people to work from home, but it was just end up being, an, um, I think it ended up being five mm -hmm. or six people who just really had nothing to do if they weren't in the building and they're working. We just put them to work doing something else. Yeah, yeah. I had a similar situation, Shelly, where um, with a small group like that, um, and, and this was, I think, a real extraordinary measure, but the, the employer chose to uh, pay for them to take online courses uh, to achieve different skills that they didn't have. Mm. 
because the work that they were doing, like your, your male folks just went away and they took that, you know, two or three week period to get these people skilled in other areas so that they, when they came back, not only was it a benefit to them, it was a benefit to the organization because they had some cross training. So they weren't necessarily working, but they were still benefiting the organization and keeping their jobs. That's great. I think it is an interesting uh, question though. I have a good friend who said, I've had so many meetings with my boss that, <clears throat> excuse me, I shouldn't be worried about my job, that now I'm really worried about my job. <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, I, again, I, I go back to transparency. I mean, Vicki and I are, are very, you know, sort of, you know, we, we talk openly. We've applied for the PPP loan. You know, this is what that yeah. will achieve. You know, the, these are, we're, we're just, we're just very transparent and open. Yeah. What else we got in there, Michael? Um, I think, I don't think there's anything else new. No. Well, the, just the one I'd raised earlier about the, uh, how, how do you make people feel not second class when they're returned mm -hmm. for a low. I, I think you just, again, it's, it's communication, pulling people in, making, talking to them about the role that they want to be in and making so, so that they know that they're still valuable. I mean, certainly you can't just give it an open, open forum, like create your own job and tell me what you want to do. I mean, there's obviously a happy medium there. Um, but, but, but finding a place that makes sense for them and where they feel like they're, they're contributing to the organization. And, you know, I just think a lot of communication, quite frankly, and transparency. It's not yeah. that you weren't valued. We just, th this job couldn't have existed for whatever reason, you know, in, in the pandemic remotely, whatever the answer is. Um, I think, you know, hindsight is certainly 2020, but it sort of makes me think, do your employees already feel appreciated and, if, and valued? And hopefully if they do, they understand like you guys, ha half of your team had to get laid off purely because of economics. And then within 72 hours, your lives have changed. Um, I guess maybe the lesson is, do people feel valued working for you every day? I, I hope that they do. So that if something like that happens, they understand then what happened between Tuesday and Friday. And when you called them to come back, they were, you know, they know they were being met with open arms and vice versa. Um, that's, that's a hard question. I think transparency and communication is really the best way. Yeah. And I think another element of that transparency too is non-personalizing it. It's not that we felt you, Shelley, were not important. It's the skill set that that job provided to the organization during this particular time. We could get by without it and we needed to for economic reasons. It doesn't m diminish your response, your, pers your personal value to the organization. It was a business decision based on the job and the job skill set. Yeah. Yeah. I would just like to reiterate before we close, if we have a few other questions, we can cover them. But if you have a story that you want to share, just feel free to reach out to me. We would love to highlight one or two or as many of you as we can every Wednesday as we do this. So my information's on the screen. Reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you and 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 allow us to learn what, what you are doing well and how the rest of us might be able to take bits and pieces of it or just steal the whole damn thing and implement it at our respective companies. I think that's what we miss for me personally, that's what I miss about being connected with everybody and going to real life happy hours and seeing you in the city and meeting you at different events. I miss that and uh, I miss sort of the sharing and hopefully this provided an opportunity for you to get a little bit of that back and maybe we'll be able to see our friends next week. We'll work on that, I think. Well, we, we had a suggestion to make this a Zoom meeting as opposed to a Zoom webinar. And oh, would allow okay. More so like we oh, said, we're learning. I think that makes sense. And I think that this one was more of a little more content driven and yeah. the yeah. next one will be a little more hanging Shots. out. Uh, uh, drinking driven. <laughs> Shots. Everybody make jello shots. We're taking it back to college. <laughs> we need to invite Rich so he can pay. That's what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe one last call for any other questions. We have another minute or two. No more questions coming in. I would just ask for people to, you know, to reiterate, to, um, to share with us anything that would make this better and more valuable for you. Cause that was the reason we put this together was to give us that opportunity. So we need to hear from you. What can we be doing that makes us as valuable as possible to all of us every week? All right, everyone. Cheers. 
Thank you. Nice yeah. talking to you. Stay, stay well. Reach out if you need any help. We look forward to talking to you next week and seeing you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.